Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks again for attending another Authors of Google event up in the San Francisco office. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Danny Goldberg to San Francisco. Over his 35-year career, Danny has been an influential figure in the world of rock and roll. He did PR for Led Zeppelin. He managed the career of Nirvana. He ran Atlantic Records, Mercury Records, and Warner Brothers Records. He launched Stevie Nicks solo career, and in his new book, Bumping Into Geniuses, he takes us through his stories about the performers who represent a broad and powerful portion of the psychic real estate of, rock and, of the rock and roll kingdom. Patti Smith, Warren Zevon, Bruce Springsteen, Kiss, Kurt Cobain and Nirvana, Hole, Stevie Nicks, Bonnie Raitt, Steve Earle, Led Zeppelin, and more. Please help me in welcoming Danny Goldberg. Thanks for uh, having me. I'll, I'll try. Uh, I'll try not to keep looking at my BlackBerry. Um, <laughs> this is a history book. It doesn't uh, talk hardly anything about what the music business is today. Although I still am in the business, I have a small management company and handle Steve Earle, Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine, The Hives and uh, six or seven other artists, and I'm quite enjoying doing that. That is my day job. Um, but this book starts in 1969 when I reviewed the Woodstock Festival at the age of 19 for Billboard and ends with the death of Warren Zevon in 2004. And um, it's, it, certainly rock and roll existed before I got into it, as you know, Elvis and all that, and it continues to to go on, and I don't pretend to know everything about it. But but through the through the eyes of working with the artists that I work with, I think I give a piece of a clue of kind of what happened during the those 35 years. Um, what I've been doing uh, when I go to bookstores and so on is reading kind of an excerpt from the introduction, and then hopefully somebody will have questions about either some of the artists in the book or rock and roll or the music business. Uh, so I feel a little bit like John McCain reading from Talking Points. <laughs> but uh, I'm nothing like him. <laughs> there aren't any secrets, Atlantic Records President Jerry Wexler growled at me as if I were the dumbest person he'd ever met. I was 19, it was the winter of 1969, more than 35 years before Wexler would be immortalized by Richard Schiff's portrayal of him in the movie Ray. I was writing a column at that time for the weekly trade magazine Record World, and Wexler had asked one of his execs to gather a group of young journalists who wrote about rock to meet him. The real Jerry Wexler was far more imposing than the cinematic version. He was broad-shouldered with a salt and pepper beard, sunken eyes that gave him the look of an Old Testament prophet. He had a defiantly thick Bronx accent, an intimidating intellect, and the ultimate rock and roll and R&B pedigrees. Some months earlier at the storied Greenwich Village nightclub, The Village Gate, I'd seen a talented R&B singer named Judy Clay dedicate her hit Storybook Children to Wexler, and he stood up and waved with an understated noblesse oblige to, to the audience. I had no idea what a record company president actually did, but I was stunned that such a soulful singer would publicly acknowledge a mere businessman. But I soon discovered that he had also worked with Otis Redding, Aretha Franklin, Sam and Dave, and he had been the person at Atlantic who actually signed Led Zeppelin. My awe at his resume was reinforced by seeing his house in Great Neck, Long Island, which had an entire room filled with gold records and a living room with original legers. Amidst thick marijuana smoke, he played records on his state-of-the-art stereo with the big speakers, alternating an acetate of a forthcoming Delaney and Bonnie album with the Beatles' Abbey Road. It was a relief to me to know that even an insider like Wexler was a Beatles fan. During a moment between songs and a lame attempt to enter the conversation, I asked him if he was going to an upcoming conference on the music business. I never go to those things, he snarled. The premise is that you can go there, that you can go there and learn secrets. First of all, there aren't any secrets, he paused dramatically, and then with a wolfish grin concluded. And second of all, if there were any secrets, we wouldn't tell them. Over the next several decades, I'd kind of come to understand what he meant. Although I never came close to equaling his historical contribution to the music business, I was lucky enough to find myself in many situations that would make rock history. I had the press pass at the Woodstock Festival, worked for Zeppelin from, 90, from 1973 to 76, managed Nirvana when Nevermind came out, and Bonnie Raitt when she won her four Grammys, did PR for Kiss, Electric Like or or Orchestra, and others, and at the peak of Fleetwood Mac's popularity, I helped launch Stevie Nicks' solo career. And 24 years after meeting Wexler, I was given his old job as president of Atlantic. 
I can't be objective about the music business. I know it hurt a lot of people. Artists were often lied to. Royalties weren't always paid. Bad people sometimes got promoted. Good ones were fired. Drugs, misogyny, and death stalked rock and roll. A lot of schlock was produced. A lot of pretense masked shallow materialistic quests for fame and money. It's not like I don't know these things, and it's not like I mind writing about them. It's just part of the music business that I know best, rock and roll business, also did produce and popularize a lot of music that I love, and it gave me and a lot of my friends a place in the world. One non-secret of the business was that no one became a rock star by accident or against their will. Bob Dylan's memoir, Chronicles, begins not with a reference to Woody Guthrie or Allen Ginsberg, but with a meeting Dylan had as a young man with a music publisher who showed him the studio on the west side of Manhattan where Bill Haley and the Comets had recorded Rock Around the Clock. Now, folk music did have an aesthetic that existed separate and apart from commerciality, but the very point of Dylan going electric was not merely that he was adapting a more complex musical backdrop for his songs, but that he was consciously entering a world and a business defined at the time by the Beatles. One of the salient points about Like a Rolling Stone was that it went to number one on the pop charts. If it hadn't been a hit, it wouldn't have mattered anywhere as much. Members of the Jefferson Airplane, the Grateful Dead, the Loving Spoonful, the Birds, and many other big rock bands all started as folkies. And far from selling out, they were buying into a rock and roll culture and a business that from the very beginning had been as much or more about money and success than it was about the nuances of art. But the trade-off was that rock and roll was a vehicle that could impact millions of more people, and yes, make some of the artists a lot of money. The contradictions between art and commerce were not something that took folk artists by surprise, but was implicit in their decision to enter the world of rock in the first place. I was one of millions of rock fans who went to high school in the 1960s, one of a thousand or so who figured a way into the business in the years that followed. And I had all the contradictions of rock and roll. Like most of my colleagues, I soon got caught up in the sometimes grim reality of what did and what did not make money. And like most of them, I never stopped being a fan. At a memorial service for Ahmed Erdogan, who was the founder of Atlantic Records and Wexler's partner and boss, David Geffen, who had become a billionaire from the music business, repeated one of Ahmed's aphorisms about the rock business. The way to get rich was to keep walking around until you bumped into a genius. And when you did, hold on and don't let go. I mean, of course, no genius was likely to let you hold on very long if you didn't have anything to offer them. One had to know something valuable about aspects of the way the business worked. Some successful rock businessmen started as record producers or musicians, some as tour managers or concert promoters. Many offered financial expertise, some were lawyers. I began in the subculture of rock criticism and publicity, and over the years developed a reasonable number of clues about radio promotion, the workings of record companies, and the, and the dynamics of touring as well. I had been in the 10th and 11th grade in 1965 when the rock and roll business was in the middle of the dramatic expansion and reinvention that had begun with the launch of the Beatles a year before. In March of 65, Dylan had released his first electric album, Bringing It All Back Home, a coherent and brilliant body of work with songs like Mr. Tambourine Man and Gates of Eden. In July of 65, the Rolling Stones released Out of Our Heads, much, much of it edgy and rebellious for the time. This was the album that had satisfaction on it, and also the first ironic commentary on the record business itself, a song called Under Assistant West Coast Promo Man. And in December, the Beatles responded to the challenge by releasing Rubber Soul, which was widely considered their first serious album. Before these albums, the main rock and roll product was a single, which sold for around 79 cents. And after 1965, the dominant creative and business product was the album, which sold for five to ten times as much. And to the new generation of rock fans like me in those days, these albums were worth every penny. Every photo, every word of the liner notes, every song was another window into the minds of artists who were perceived by their fans as the coolest and most interesting people in the world. Among the biggest and most talented rock stars I would meet when I got into the business, even those with a fierce sense of integrity balanced their artistry with streaks of pragmatism. For example, in 1980, I worked with Bruce Springsteen in the context of making No Nukes, which was a political concert documentary, it featured several of his live performances. While waiting for the editors to queue up an edit one night, he mused about how elusive a top 40 single had been for him. I mean, Born to Run had been a press phenomenon, and so had Darkness on the Edge of Town, but he'd never gotten onto top 40 radio. I was amazed to hear that Bruce had recently met with a guy named Cal Rudman who ran a radio tip sheet called a Friday Morning Quarterback. This tip sheet was filled with radio and promo hype, 
Rudman in person talked with glib, high-pressure shtick. He was the personification of the old-school pop business hypester that was the ultimate contrast to Springsteen's intense, poetic, unpretentious rock and roll persona. Cal explained to me, said Springsteen in his urgent horse drawl, the top 40 radio is mainly listened to by girls, and my female demographic is low. And I thought about the songs on Darkness, which was his previous album, and I realized the lyrics were mostly for, for and about guys. So on this new album I'm working on, there are some songs for girls. I mean, just to hear the boss utter the word demographic <laughs> was a shock to my system. But then again, why wouldn't he want to appeal to as many people as possible? And indeed, his next album, The River, released several months later, had, in addition to its many poetic gems and macho, macho celebrations that protected his identity with his fans, included as its first single, Hungry Heart, which featured a sped up vocal, a romantic lyric, and retro harmonies by the 60s pop duo, The Turtles. And the result was Springsteen did, as he planned, finally have his first top 40 hit. Of course, the fantasy of rock and roll liberation was often dashed by the reality of the business. Drug and alcohol abuse were far too common. The tragic arc of Elvis Presley's career was a metaphor for the dark side of rock and roll, materialistic, druggy, and predictable. Kurt Cobain, the greatest rock artist I would ever work with up close, shot himself to death, and he was only one of dozens of brilliant artists who died decades before their times. No one artist or group of artists can contain the sprawling and complex totality of rock and roll, but I believe the ones I write about, Led Zeppelin, Kiss, Stevie Nicks, Bonnie Raitt, Sonic Youth, Nirvana, Hole, Warren Zevon, Patti Smith, and Steve Earle, among others, represent a broad and powerful portion of the psychic real estate of the rock and roll kingdom. And I'm not objective about any of them. I love them all. So that's an expert for, excuse me, an excerpt from the introduction. And Hopefully some of you have some questions or want to talk about some of the people in the book or about the book or about the, the business. Yes, sir. Yeah, you, just said that Kirk, <coughs> you just said that Kirk Cobain was one of the, um, the geniuses that you worked with. Could you kind of expand on why you think him, him in particular and, and maybe compare and contra contrast him to some of the others? Sure, yeah. There was a review in The Guardian in London last week where the guy said, how could he say this? Zeppelin is much more important than the history of rock and roll. What, what, what I mean by it is he did so many different things well. For example, just in the context of the band, he was the lead singer and the lead guitar player. He wrote the lyrics and the music. So just to begin with, if you want to compare it to Zeppelin, he did everything that J Jimmy Page does and everything that Robert Plant did. He also had this fully blown vision of rock and roll culturally. It was very at variance to the personal torments he had, which is obviously the other side of him and the side that killed himself. But in the context of being an artist, he designed the album covers. I don't mean he just had an idea. He would do a very detailed sketch of exactly what the album cover should be. All the music videos he, uh, he wrote scene by scene treatments of. You know, typically artists will ask seven or eight video directors to give them treatments. He had an exact vision of each one of them. He, uh, he even designed the t-shirts. I remember being at lunch with him once discussing something else and just on a napkin he, he gave it to me and said, here's the, here's the next t-shirt. After they became famous, as much as he was rooted in and, and, and loyal to in some ways the punk ethos, he also had a keen understanding of, of the mass global media and he would make sure once, once he knew that photographs of him were going to be seen around the world, he almost never wore the same shirt twice. He kept changing his hair color. He had a real sense of his relationship with this global audience of people who empathized with him. He was an incredible performer. Uh, I didn't even understand when I first worked with him what I was getting. I, I met them through Sonic Youth. I, I was trying to make a living. And I was already close to 40. I was, I was uh, the older avuncular figure. I had a younger partner named John Silva who, who, who understood the alternative and punk ethos far better than I did. And together we got Sonic Youth and he told me that, that uh, uh, Thurston Moore and, and Kim Gordon of Sonic Youth loved Nirvana and they'd open in Europe. And you know, it just sounded like a good idea to me and I just sort of been one of those routine things. We flew them to LA. They were auditioning managers and they liked us. I think probably because we worked with Sonic Youth and maybe a little bit because you know, Chris Novoselic in particular was kind of a liberal activist and he liked that part of me. And then a few months later when I saw them live, this was before Nevermind came out, I realized how lucky I was to have made that kind of impulsive move because he had this thing on stage, even when people didn't know the material, again, Smells Like Teen Spirit hadn't come out yet, to connect with an audience on such an intimate level. It was at the palace and they were opening to 
Dinosaur Jr. The Palace holds about 1,200 people in LA. It's kind of a shabby rock, th small rock theater. And, uh, you know, I just got this sense that somehow he was both in the audience and on the stage at the same time. I can't really explain how he did it, but he had a tremendous gift for creating a sense of intimacy with fans. So he was, he was great at all these different things. And, and that, that was, uh, he was also the kind of guy that if you were at his house, he was always doing a drawing, a painting, a poem. Uh, he, there, there was a whole torrent of creativity. So I'm not saying he's the most brilliant person ever to work in rock and roll. I'm saying he's the most brilliant person that I met. And I met, I've worked with a lot of talented people, but no one who had all of those skills, both as an artist and as an understanding of the mass appeal dimensions of it, and as an innovator, because he really, I mean, Nirvana did, you know, change the culture of rock and roll overnight. There was, there had been a long time alternative subculture that hated commercial rock and roll and uh, fanzines and indie record stores and college radio stations trafficked in that. But that was a very small audience of maybe, like his thing at the beginning was he wanted Nirvana to be as big as the Pixies, who in numerical terms would sell maybe 300,000 albums and, you know, could s sell a couple of thousand tickets, but Nirvana, you know, never mind sold 10, 10 million records, so it was, you know, more than 30 times bigger than what was otherwise one of the biggest of the alternative acts. So he took what was a subculture and made it a mass culture, almost with the force of his, just his creativity. He just understood somehow and empathized with the psyche, and it wasn't just in the United States. I mean, Nirvana impacted in France and in Japan and Australia and in England and in Germany and Eastern Europe with the exact same velocity that it did it here. And I can assure you it was all about the music. When the album went to number one a few months after it came out, the New York Times did a story about it because it was bigger than, you know, Michael Jackson, who had previously been the biggest pop act. And they, they asked Eddie Rosenblatt, then the president of Geffen, what the marketing plan had been. And he said the marketing plan was get out of the way and duck. And we all loved that because that's that's what we all did. It was, it, it was, it was, uh, it was really his. It was his brain that created that. Yes, sir. Um, so, continuing on uh, with the Nirvana questions. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, and, and I, cr I apologize if it wasn't you that that I'm thinking of, but there was a rather famous uh, policy that was instituted by their management on, I believe, their last tour through Europe. It was like a no alcohol policy uh, or something like that. Do you, is that something you recall or? No, that oh, okay. sounds, uh, that sounds like something somebody made up. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, they, well they mentioned, uh, the, they mentioned it themselves during one of the, I think, I think well, it was maybe, a show. Well maybe, they were, maybe they were struggling with it. I mean, yeah. I know Chris has had his issues on and off with alcohol and he's yeah. been sober for some time now, but, but, but at that time he, he may have had his issues with it. Uh, I love Kurt very much, and I miss him terribly. But if it wasn't alcohol, he found stronger things. Yeah. So you know, I, I don't think it was exactly a vegan, straight edge uh, environment. <laughs> but uh, you know, the idea of trying to uh, be healthier, you know, was something they struggled with. Yeah. Okay. And then the last question that I that I had was uh, Led Zeppelin. You think it's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely the 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 question that I, obviously the true answer is I have no idea. The, the person who's going to decide is Robert Plant. There's no question that the other guys would like to do it. I, I did go to London to see the reunion show, and it was fabulous. I mean, Jimmy Page played as well as he ever did, and anyone who's seen Robert with Alison Krauss knows that his voice is fine. Um, you know, Jason Bonham is not John Bonham. You know, he can, he can copy everything his dad did. He can't create new things like his dad did on a nightly basis, but it was very, very good show, but Robert's doing really well on his own. You know, for years when the band started, it was Jimmy Page's band, and Robert had to kind of do what Jimmy wanted, and now he's like the successful guy, and my guess is sometime in the next couple of years, when, when he's fully satisfied with this cycle, he'll stare off into space and call Jimmy up and say, all right, let's, let's, let's go make a billion dollars, but, uh, <laughs> which is, I think, what a Led Zeppelin tour would gross worldwide. But uh, that's my guess. Uh, but it's up to him. There's no question about it. The other guys are ready, waiting by the phone. Yes. Hey, quick question for you about uh, the industry and how it adopts technology. Like looking back at like the film industry, you know, its first impulse was to kill the VCR, and then early on there were efforts to kill MP3 players about 10 years ago. So just wondering, what's the general level of uh, technological 
understanding of people that are running the industry and also any thoughts you might have about the future? Yeah, I think this internet thing is going to be big. Um, <laughs> well, it certainly makes, well, you're talking about the subcultures. It actually makes it a lot easier for these subcultures. That's exactly right. You're absolutely right. It makes it far easier for subcultures and it's liberated a whole group of artists from the need to please radio stations. You know, I think when people complained about record companies, and God knows there were some dreadful people at record companies and, and some good people as well. But, but, and like any business, they were driven by the quest for quarterly profits. They were mostly public companies. But, but a lot of what, what controlled the, the uh, mass culture were the radio stations. Because all the record, the record companies uh, spent the biggest marketing cost record companies had, especially up until seven or eight years ago, was promotion departments that would do anything, uh, sometimes illegally if they could get away with it, and certainly within the boundaries of what was legal to get uh, music on the radio. But the biggest thing uh, that they would bump up against was that radio stations were their own businesses. And radio stations were in the business of selling advertising to the widest possible audience that fit the demographic of whatever the advertisers wanted. And the music business, whether it was managers, artists, or record companies, were in the business not of the most number of people, but the subset of those people who were passionate fans who would buy concert tickets, T-shirts, you know, box sets, and 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 so on. And so, uh, you know, that uh, the phrase "corporate rock," for example, which was a you know pejorative term, uh, you know, and if you go on Wikipedia, I write in Wikipedia they define the the, the classic example of classic rock was a band called Styx from. Chicago, and I, I knew and worked with Dennis the Young, the lead singer and songwriter of Sticks, really well. And the fact is, no record company ever told him what to do. They did everything in Chicago. He hated his record company, and they hated him. Um, but it was the radio stations, it was those corporations that, that were saying, you know, we, we need music that appeals to a passive audience. So even though all we cared about was the active audience, if you didn't please the passive audience, the researchers who dictated programming would, would eliminate you from from airplay. And that, that, that had a lot of influence over the business. The internet has, has weakened the stranglehold of radio formats on access to a mass audience. Not that radio is still not important, but it's much less important than it was because of all these different ways, whether it's trading songs on MySpace or uh, uh, Pandora's box or these different kind of things that, that, um, that allows a niche music to find uh, you know, cult audiences. So while it's harder to reach a mass audience, there's not the one-stop shopping that uh, TRL on MTV used to give you. It's much easier for idiosyncratic and to me culturally more creative artists to find you know, you know, niche audiences. I, I don't pretend to be an expert on the business. You know, I, um, I left the major label world, not, not by choice. I was thrown out after Universal bought Polygram and they merged the different divisions. I, there was musical chairs, there was no chair for me. And then I had my own label called Artemis for a while and I ran Air America Radio for a year and then I've had this business. So it's been eight or nine years since I've been in the major system and during a time of thousands of lost jobs, billions of dollars of lost valuation. Um, I think they're in a tough spot. I think the side of the business is the healthiest and that I focus on with my clients is the concert business because if you try to get into a show without a ticket, there's a big guy that won't let you in. <laughs> you know, we can enforce payment of that. And licensing is very important, uh, so, you know, getting songs into video games or TV commercials, TV series or, or movies, that's still something you can monetize. And, and album sales are in free fall and, and may never, you know, come back. I don't know what I would do if I were the big companies. I think, uh, I'm not sure, I think there were a lot of stupid things done. But I'm not sure even if you all were running the record companies that you could have done anything about it because I think the wave of technology just made payment for albums very difficult. And I'm not sure that even a bunch of smarter people could have done much about that. I think it's like being in the ice business when refrigerators came along, you know. Follow up, you, you said albums and singles earlier. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention iTunes here, but I mean, that is a big, you know, at the moment, they're the big, <laughs> at the moment, I said, they're the big uh, purveyor of, uh, of uh, paid, uh, paid music. And obviously, uh, uh, most of their sales are individual tracks. Uh, you know, I have two teenagers, that's, you know, I, and it, it's all charged to my credit card, so I do see, I, and they send you this thing each time what they're buying, and you know, 90% of the time they're buying a track. Every once in a while, if it's an artist like Kanye West or somebody that they really love, they'll buy the album. And that's, uh, that's just the way it's going to be. I mean, there's no, 
there's no reversing that. I mean, as a consumer, you know, I can understand why, you know, there are a lot of albums that I would have wanted the whole album, certainly. Uh, you know, the Bob Dylan records, I'm a Dylan nerd like most aging hippies, you know, and I wanted all of his albums, but there were plenty of other records where I would have been perfectly happy with one or two songs, and that's an irreversible fact, you know, but that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is not people buying individual tracks, but people getting it for free. And I don't uh, know what to do about it, and I, I don't think about it that much. I'm, I'm trying to deal in real time representing my clients today. I'm not like an industry strategist or philosopher. If I got one of those jobs, I try to learn more about what to tell them. But I really like working for artists, and that's, that's, what I, that's what I do now. And to me, it's about understanding next three, six, nine, 12 months for Tom Morello. What does he do? How does he build an audience? And uh, you know, there's some very exciting things about the environment uh, in terms of reaching niche audiences, developing an e li email list of your fans, and so on. And, um, and, it's, and it's also a lot more work for the artist, because there's not the way of plugging in like, like to big radio stations or big, uh, uh, big uh, MTV uh, audiences, uh, you know, with, with you know, 30 spins a week that you used to be able to have. But it is, it is what it is, and uh, I focus mostly on how to build a concert audience worldwide for my clients, because the same syndrome, obviously, that's happened here is it's a worldwide, you know, f you know, phenomenon. So you'd mentioned for, uh, for Nirvana, for instance, there really was no marketing plan. It was getting out of the way. But I'm actually interested in your experiences, I guess, uh, originally how it was 20, 30 years ago in terms of putting the marketing plan together for a band, for like a Led Zeppelin and, um, and well, you said you didn't for Nirvana. But, and then, you know, some of your, obviously, I think you just talked about the way it is today. So I think we have a, an idea of that. But if you wanted to expand on that as well, that'd be interesting. Well, um what I try to do in this book is, is to be very specific. I'm not trying to give a total, although I give some context to the development of trends. You know, my knowledge of Led Zeppelin is mostly when I worked for them. You know, I, I don't pretend to have, you know, chart the whole history of Led Zeppelin. I like 73 through 76. That's what I write about because that's when I was there and when I can offer some, some personal observations that a typical journalist, you know, couldn't, couldn't give because they weren't, you know, there. And, and, and so by the time I work with them, by 73, uh, Led Zeppelin was already uh, commercially the biggest band in the world. I mean, their first album had come out in 1969. Stairway to Heaven had come out on the previous record, which was their fourth record. This is the one with all the mystical symbols with no title. And, um, and they wanted, uh, I was, I was uh, 22 and working for a showbiz uh, PR firm called Salters and Roskin that had like Ringling Brothers Circus and Frank Sinatra and Barbara Streisand. They wanted one young, long-haired, uh, guy, uh, you know, my hair was longer then and I actually had cheekbones that you could see. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was the rock guy because I'd come out, I knew all the rock writers. I'd been around for a few years and knew all the, you know, kind of the Rolling Stone writers and the people who wrote about rock and roll for the daily newspapers and so on. And, um, and, and, and the band uh, wanted, they had, they had been um, ridiculed or ignored by, by the rock press, counterintuitively. They're now considered one of the iconic groups in, in, in the history of rock and roll, but you know, the, 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 the psychology of rock criticism was it kind of started in 1966 with a college student at, uh, at uh, I think it was at Brandeis, St. Paul, he created this magazine called Crawdaddy, and he was a bad businessman, so then Jan Wenner started Rolling Stone and hired a bunch of the Crawdaddy writers. And, um, so by 69, these were grizzled veterans of rock criticisms. They were like 23, 24 years old, and they kind of looked down at the audience of 15 and 16 year olds that were Zeppelin fans. Plus they were marginalized because in the intervening years, rock radio had come along. And it is interesting, San Francisco is the home of all of these things. You know, Rolling Stone started in San Francisco and rock, the so-called what was called the underground radio format also started in San Francisco. And um, so, you know, when the Jefferson Airplane first came out, I mean, the, the writers were the people who told all us hippies about them. But by the time Zeppelin came out, it was just on the radio, and like in 48 hours, all over the country, people had heard uh, Good Times, Bad Times, and some of the other songs on the first Zeppelin album. So, so the, the, the critics, first of all, kind of resented that they'd been uh, marginalized, or what do you call it, the disintermediated, you know, <laughs> by rock radio. And then secondly, um, there was that generational thing where people who were 23 had that snobbish disdain. What do these young people know? They don't know what real music is. You know, a real blues-influenced band is the Stones or Cream, Zeppelin, or you know these new, you know, kind of 
they're too derivative, as if like all of the other rock bands weren't derivative. <laughs> so, so they were ridiculed, and, and when House of the Holy came out, uh, which was the fifth album, the one that I started working with them, and the Rolling Stone headline to the review said, Led Zepp 5, A Limp Limp. And most people today, when they look back, will consider that one of the great rock and roll albums ever. I certainly do. But, um, so, so that was a particular job, and it had to do with the sort of psychology of the press. And some people say, well, why did Zeppelin care? Well, you know what, famous people like to be even more famous. People who are successful like to be even more successful. I mean, I know you would know nothing about that being in Google. <laughs> you're always just satisfied with wherever you are. But, you know, rock, rock musicians are the same, you know. And they, they wanted, the Rolling Stones had been on the cover of Newsweek the year before, and Truman Capote had gone on tour with them, and it irritated Zeppelin. They wanted to be perceived and recognized as having dethroned the Stones. And, and the press was sort of the one mountain that they hadn't climbed. And it was very difficult because there were like, you know, 40 or 50 people writing about rock and roll who, who had already made up their minds. And so the only thing I could come up with was to just sell the statistics. You know, they did this show in Tampa where it was 56,800 people and that was like about a thousand more than the Beatles had when they sold out Shea Stadium. Not because Led Zeppelin was more popular than the Beatles, because there were more seats in Tampa Stadium than there had been in Shea Stadium in New York. But it was a contrivance that worked. You know, I got a, a UPI writer in Tampa to say, you know, beat the Beatles record, which was just a made up record. I mean, Woodstock had already happened with half a million people, but so that was a multiple artist festival, not a one artist concert. And because it's just show business and it's not uh, politics or, uh, or science, uh, you know, bullshitting works. You know, <laughs> they just needed something to write about. And uh, when Zeppelin did their reunion concert in London, they showed this little bit of videotape with footage from Tampa with the guy breathlessly saying, broke the Beatles record. You know, I felt validated all these years later. The <laughs> band was acknowledging <laughs> that they liked that uh, shtick. Uh, and then um, there was a guy named Bob Hilburn. I don't know if you know that name, but he's the longtime music editor at the Los Angeles Times. And he's a few years older than me, and, and he, he's a... Uh, he bought the argument that the main rock writers were too old to understand Zeppelin. And so he got a high school kid to interview them for the Los Angeles Times. And that high school kid was the 15-year-old Cameron Crowe, who went on to become the writer-director of Almost Famous and uh, Jerry Maguire and a lot of other good movies. And um, the band really opened up to Cameron. They liked him because he was like a fan. He wasn't snobbish, and they didn't feel like defensive around him. And he wrote this really nice piece. and then. And then the next tour, Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone had never given them time of day. Then in 73, they wanted to put them on the cover, and Jimmy Page said, fuck them, they've always pissed on us, no. So I said, okay, we'll make that a thing. I said, the band who turned down Rolling Stone. Then <laughs> in 75, and Jan Winter, and I, believe me, I didn't know Jan Winter very well, but I was the guy to call about Led Zeppelin, and they were going to sell me, so he called me and says, look, you know, we know they're mad at us for all the bad reviews, but how about... We'll put them on the cover. We'll do it as a Q&A so there's no chance of any s snide editorializing in the article, and they can pick who interviews them. So I called Jimmy and I said, look, you know, last time it was cool to turn them down. Maybe this time say, yes, you're not going to do better than this. And, and yeah, he, he, he'd made his point. And, and he said, and let's get Cameron Crowe to do the interview. So that was another, like, part of it. So that wasn't, I mean, again, they were already a huge band, but in terms of evolving their imaging through the psychology of some of the writers and editors and so on who were the gatekeepers, that was kind of the part of the process. Um, you know, every artist is different. Some of them, it's all about getting on the radio. Some was about touring. Uh, being on, um, opening act to a big artist was very important. It still is, playing these festivals like Bonnaroo or Coachella, uh, you know, what's left of Lollapalooza or, um, you know, some of the other festivals is today still a very important way of introducing. You look at a band like My Morning Jacket, I think they've really emerged as much by playing festivals as by any other, you know, marketing tool. So that's one thing that hasn't changed all that much is the importance of exposure, you know, to big audiences through being, you know, a special guest or an opening act. And, you know, sometimes it was who produced the record, the sound of the record, like what I described with Springsteen getting getting a slightly different sound in order to get onto some radio stations. For some artists, the videos were very important after MTV emerged in 1982 uh, as, as a big thing. You know, that was like one of those overnight changes. There was no MTV and then there was MTV. And, um, you know, there's other things that sometimes work. But the most important thing really was 
all the rest of us did everything we could to expose the music to people. That's marketing music, is getting people to hear it. Then it's about the relationship between the music and the audience. There's no other marketing you can do. You can just try to get people to listen a few times. And if they like it, they tell their friends about it. And if they don't, they don't. So that's still true. It's just how you get them to hear it the first time has changed. I think we have a question from one of the remote offices. Oh, cool. Do I look at the screen to make eye contact? Oh, is that, is that me? That's you, dude. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I empowered, had... you know. <laughs> you look empowered. Right? Um, I, have, I, I have two questions. The first one is, is in this kind of time of change where the majors are tanking and uh, nobody's quite sure how to, how to make it work, what, what advice would you give to an up-and-coming band um, who has their sights set high? And my second question is, um, you mentioned before that, that nobody you know, gets famous in rock and roll through kind of shunning it and, and, uh, and kind, of, kind of shunning the rock star thing, but Kurt Cobain was kind of famous for that, and I was just wondering what your thoughts were on kind of his public sincerity uh, of that of that sentiment, just kind of not wanting to be a rock star, and how much of that was actually true. I'll, I'll start with the Kurt part of it, and then I'll come up. I mean, whatever I would ha tell bands is going to be a little on the platitude side because um, no two bands are the same, and so what would work for one artist wouldn't work for another. But with regard to Kurt, um, he uh, the, the the best example I can give is. Um, is uh, there came a time when Rolling Stone wanted to do a cover on Nirvana after Nevermind had been number one for X number of months. And he had always hated Rolling Stone because they, um, they kind of ignored the culture that he really loved. And they, they never wrote about bands like the Melvins or uh, a lot of the other uh, uh, punk and alternative and indie groups that he felt were making the most interesting music. And uh, so I, um, he did the interview and then they, they were in Australia at the time, and then um, then they wanted to do a photo session. I got this hysterical uh, call from the Geffen publicist. He doesn't want to do a photo session. So I said, well, you know, it's up to him. So then he called me and says, I hate fucking Rolling Stone. I don't want to do a photo session for Rolling Stone. I said, all right, don't. You know, I mean, being a manager is being an employee. I mean, the word manager is a little misleading. <laughs> the main thing we do is, is represent and be an advocate for the artist. Every once in a while, if we think they're really making a mistake, we'll tell them and every once in a while they'll listen but 90% of the job is you work for them you're their representative to the world I wasn't gonna tell them I didn't give a shit if he did the photo or not I mean they were already this huge cultural phenomenon so I said so don't do it I said the only thing is he says well will, will we still be on the cover if I don't take the photo <laughs> I said uh, no what are they gonna put on the cover the album cover I said they have their pride too they'd rather have the photo but no they're not gonna use some stock photo on the cover of Rolling Stone so if you want to be on the cover take a photo if you don't it's fine you don't need to be on the cover of Rolling Stone you're already you know number one whatever you want so so he he took the photo and then um, I saw the photo a few days later. This was before everybody could email photos, you know. And uh, he was wearing a T-shirt that I think he'd handwritten onto it that said, Corporate Rock Magazine Still Suck. <laughs> so I felt at the time, you know, that's pretty fucking lame. You know, I mean, you're, you, you know, just in my own head, I didn't tell him this, but I would think, you know, you're taking the photo for the magazine and then saying that they suck, but then why did you take the photo? Um, but that photo has become one of the iconic photos of Kurt Cobain and what he was really saying is listen I know this is a, a bullshit game but I'm gonna win it on my own terms and that's what he wanted to do I mean there's just no question that he wanted to be famous and that he wanted to do it on his own terms there's also no question that that he didn't like everything about having accomplished what he wanted I mean there's that cliche be careful what you wish for you might get it and certainly he's an example of that but um, you know, this was a guy that would call me if he was watching MTV and Pearl Jam was getting more spins than Nirvana was and asked me why, who's mad at us there, and who, uh, who uh, you know, was very conscious when he made a record of which was going to be the first single and who, uh, who, who was uh, completely in control of every aspect of the recording. Uh, you know, um, there was this, uh, when, when he made, when they made In Utero, he asked, um, 
great punk producer named Steve Albini to produce the record because he wanted the image of connecting with the punk world. And, you know, I'm sorry if that sounds cynical, but that's just the way I see it. That was my experience with it. So Albini, you know, punk rocker that he was, took a $100,000 fee for about a week's work. Uh, <laughs> Because, because Kurt had already written all the songs, arranged all the songs. You know, producing Nirvana was, was not, uh, I'm not saying I could have done it. I don't have any musical or technical talent, but it wasn't that hard because you had a band that like learned and knew all the songs when they went to the studio. And it came back and it was very muddy sounding. And so, so Kurt, you know, played it for his friends, his family, and you know, for Courtney and for us. And he says, you know, we can't hear the voice. So he, he, he asked me who, who could remix it, and we got uh, Scott Litt, who, uh, who had done the, the, uh, worked on the R.E.M. albums, and, and Kurt loved R.E.M., uh, and he loved Scott Litt, who was a very friendly, you know, whatever the artists want kind of a guy. And he remixed uh, what became the singles from that album, uh, Heart Shape Box and All Apologies. So then Steve Albini did all these interviews saying, Geffen made the band, Geffen hates the record, Geffen Records made the band do this, and the fact is Geffen never even, First of all, contractually, they had nothing to say about it. They, they, they weren't at any of the sessions. It was, you know, Kurt wanted to, to, to have people hear his voice. And uh, he finally called Steve and told him that, and Steve stopped uh, saying it. So I think that he, he was a guy who listened to the Beatles as much as he listened to the Melvins and the Dead Kennedys. And he, he hated a lot of the trappings of show business. He, he hated himself for going to the MTV Awards, which he felt were lame. and superficial, but he went, and he went because he liked it when the videos were, were played. He made the videos. He, I told you, he wrote the scripts of all the videos. He controlled in the editing room exactly how they were edited, and he wanted to win, but then he felt uh, empty. You know, it didn't solve all of his emotional problems. He didn't particularly like being recognized. He didn't like the pressure he then put on himself because he was now in business with all these people, and uh, you know, he was a tormented guy who was prone to depression and drug abuse before he became famous, but anybody who says that he didn't want to be famous is someone who definitely did not know him. And when I was writing the book, I called Chris Novoselic just to review some of this, and, you know, I said, just tell me in your own words. I said, you know, why did you come to L.A.? Why did you want to meet us? Why did you want to be on Geffen? And he says, we, you know, he says, we, we, you know, we figured Sub Pop was going to make a deal with a big company anyway, which they did. And we, we figured, let's deal with him directly. He says, we wanted to be big. And, you know, and he says, the one who wanted to be big the most was, was Kurt. But that doesn't mean he liked all the results of it. But it was no accident. No one put a gun to his head and told him to write choruses that you could hum after hearing it once. <laughs> Uh, Danny, I just had a quick question, um, or maybe if there's an anecdote you can share, or your thoughts about this. I think one thing that gets lost in the whole Nirvana story is the sense of humor they had. And it seems to me, just kind of recalling interviews I've seen with them or that I've read with them from way back when, that they were all really funny and they seemed to have personality. And I think that the suicide, frankly, has kind of distorted that a little bit. I mean, how did they behave around you as far well, as that sort of thing goes? Um First of all, the, the best document about Nirvana is a home video with a silly title of Live Tonight in Concert Nirvana, which, although it's credited to another director who helped finish it after Kurt died, 99% of the editing was done by Kurt himself. He had all these stacks of videos in his apartment and video machines, and that was very much his commentary on what happened with Nirvana. And, and if anybody kind of wants to know what he thought of it all, watching that is, is the way. And even in the notes, the guys wrote a note together, Chris and Dave, saying this was Kurt's vision and we did our best to deliver it. And that has a lot of the humor and irreverence and, 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 and you know, joy, uh, you know, they, they, they got a lot of pleasure out of trashing the drums at the end of a, of a song and goofing on TV, uh, pompous TV hosts in Europe. And, uh, and uh, you know, they, 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 there was an interesting, but again, to give an insight into, into Kurt's level of control and thought about all this is after Nevermind came out, they played uh, at um, another bigger theater in LA. I'm forgetting the name of it right now. And uh, it was a headline show, and it was, which was about 3,000 people. And, um, he was like 5'2 and, and, and skinny, and he wasn't famous enough yet where everybody kind of knew who he was just by seeing him in a crowd. So we're just standing um, 
you know, outside the dressing room, and people were not flocking to him because a lot of the music industry types who'd come to the event didn't get that that was him. And he said, let me talk to you for a minute. He said, you know, um, in a lot of the interviews that have been published, um, I'm noticing they're emphasizing uh, politics a lot. I said, yeah. He says, well, I want people to know that we have a sense of humor. So I'm thinking, what the fuck am I supposed to do about it? I don't like write the articles or control the editors. This is one of, is this one of these musicians who thinks like I'm supposed to control the press, which, like for example, John Bonham of Led, Led Zeppelin thought my job was to control what was written. So I'm getting this, this sinking feeling of how do I get through this conversation and not hurt his feelings, not irritate him, and not lie to him about my c capability of making a difference. And he said, so I've been thinking about why this is. And I think in the second par paragraph of the bio that Geffen gives out, there's a reference to punk politics. And I think if we take that sentence out, maybe the writers won't ask as many questions about politics and they'll understand that he says, because he says, I, I mean, he was a feminist and he hated homophobia and he was in general kind of, I guess you would call him a, a liberal, but he didn't want to be perceived like a Jello Biafra or, 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 or even the Fugazi, Ian MacKay, as, as more strident because he, he, he recognized humor besides being attractive is more, frankly, commercial. And, you know, I was this PR guy for 15 years and that was part of my job and skill set and I had not noticed this and he, he had. He was so exactly right and sure enough I told him, you know, please change the bio and, you know, the character of the questions and the articles did subtly shift. So he really, th th that is really part of who they were, but the reason you know that that's part of who they were is because he wanted you to know it. So I was, uh you know, you've worked with some giants, people very well known and so forth. But I'm actually curious who the, the acts that we've never heard of that you worked out with and that to this day bug you. That, that to this day you're so like, why didn't they make it bigger? Yeah. Why it's, weren't they huge? It's certainly a long list. Um, one would be Jill Sobule, who is a singer-songwriter. I made one of her records on Armist and really an extraordinary live performer. I mean, she has a new record. She just raised money for her new record by going on her website and asking her fans to pay for it. And she raised like $80,000. She auctioned off uh, from $25 up to $10,000. For $10,000, you get to sing on the record. And there was one woman in England, <laughs> one rich woman in England who paid the ten grand and got to sing on the record. So uh, she's somebody really, really just an incredible uh, special artist who I uh, am frustrated for her sake and for mine retroactively that she, that she didn't make it bigger. And I can't explain it except just the stars were, were not aligned. So that's certainly one example that always springs to mind. You know, when I worked with Zivon, you know, the last record he made, The Wind, ended up doing pretty well and selling about 600,000 and winning a couple of Grammys because it, it had this huge amount of publicity, again, that he was a co-creator of about the fact that he was dying and people like Springsteen and Don Henley and Tom Petty all came and uh, played and in some instances sung on the record and, uh, and VH1 finally did a special on him, you know. But, but the first record I put out with him is called Life Will Kill You, which is every bit as good as The Wind, if not better. And um, I just couldn't get anyone to pay attention, you know. I remember going to VH1 and they had some new, you know, programming guy that, you know, was the beginning of what became the I Love the 80s syndrome at VH1 and they didn't want to do a behind the music on them. And, um, you know, we had a hard time with the radio station. Some of them would play them, but some of them wouldn't. I don't want to mention any. <laughs> And uh, it only sold about 75,000 records, and it's every bit as good as the one that sold 600,000, and, and, and it really broke my heart. It did better than his previous release, and it allowed us to keep making records with him, but it was certainly frustrating. Um, Steve Earle had a label for a while that, that had a lot of great artists, and I put them out, and none of them got to first base. One of them was a singer-songwriter named Anders Parker. He recorded under the name Varnaline. You know, just fabulous writer, just sold nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot more, you know, uh, uh, obviously you're trying, to, you're trying to make a book interesting to as many people as possible. I focused on, on, on mostly famous people, but there have been great artists at every stage of my career that have, for one reason or another, not connected. Uh, you know, uh, the old uh, movie star, Ruth Gordon, was in that old movie, Harold and Maud, once did an interview where she said, to make it in show business, it's not, a tough, not enough to have talent. You also have to have a talent for having talent. And I think that's, that's true. There are some people that are extraordinarily talented but don't have the talent for marketing themselves. And we can all try to help and make a difference, but we can't actually transform somebody. I think we have time for one more question. 
I, I'm curious if you, uh, looking at the industry, what's happened since you got involved, if you think the era of sort of the megastar, sort of the Michael Jackson, Madonna, that really brings, you know, a generation or just people all around the world together is somewhat coming to an end as the sort of music business become more niche-based and everyone sort of has their little segment that they cling to and is their thing. I'm curious your thought on that. Yeah. It's, a, it's a question that, that is really interesting. Um, of why did people become superstars in the first place? Was it because of the um, sort of monopoly that some media, like say the Beatles, uh, going on the Ed Sullivan Show, like the old Ed Sullivan Show, or when MTV became, was it, was it sort of the, the, the limitations of the media forced that kind of superstardom, or is there some psychological need from time to time for generations to create a superstar? My guess is that it's the latter and that there will be superstars. I, think, I don't think technology or media created that. I think even if you go back in history to before there was an electronic media, there were certain, we read about uh, Caruso or Sarah, Sarah Bernhardt or, you know, uh, Homer, you know, some <laughs> who, who became uh, kind of a, a spokesman in some way for a part of a, gener a, a, of a generation. So my guess is that, that that will continue to happen from time to time, despite the fragmentation of the media. But I can't prove it. That's just my guess is that that's created by human beings, not by technology. Great. I think we're going to have to wrap it up. But on behalf of Google and the authors of Google Program, Danny, thanks very much for coming by today. Thank you.